Greg DeVore, thank you so much for coming on the Inner Edison podcast. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's great to be here. You say that right now. Wait till the <laughs> end. Tell me at the end. It's good. Then it'll be good to leave, right? By the end. Yes. Right? <laughs> well, you know, podcasting is supposed to be a, have a conversation about, you know, certain things that your listeners want to know about. My listeners are typically business owners, people who want to start business, people who understand, you know, want to need, understand that failure is part of the process. And if you're not failing, you're not learning. So. It's very true. It's a painful way of learning, but it's the best way of learning. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you make a mistake, that's pretty big. Then you don't ever do it again. Usually. When I find that I, and I, maybe it's a different definition of failure. It's not just your mistakes, but it's your lack of success. And by really understanding, it's not necessarily you've made a mistake, but you haven't figured it out yet. Right. And, and, you know, I'm just saying, cause I've had people think that businesses are overnight successes and they take 15 years unless it's a unique business, but on average, so there's yeah. an exception to every rule. So yeah, what do no, you do? All right. So you, I read your bio and everything. And I see you started a, com a company, but uh, what's your, what's your background? So a uh, tech entrepreneur, but not your normal background. I have a film scoring degree from the Berkeley College of Music and worked in the music industry for a while, but some life events happened. I had a son born really prematurely and to get him health insurance, I had to have a company that had at least two employees. So my brother and I started this company 20 years ago, almost 21 years ago, and uh, it went on from there. It took me down a totally different path, but one that's been fun. Now, are you good with math? Well, I'm I'm a musician, so I can count to four. <laughs> Typically, because they say most musicians are good in math because of how you know the music being in yeah. that music, and so I always like to ask you know to see because there's always exceptions to every rule, right? There's... Math was a place where I felt more comfortable than other subjects. Yeah, okay. so. and that that would be the, then why the background in music. Yep. It's interesting because it, it's there's a lot of uh, developers, you know, um, software developers that mm -hmm. are also musicians and musicians that transfer into software development. So it, it's they seem very different, but they use similar sides of the brain. And and that's just I really, I think I learned that a year ago. Somebody else I was talking to, and they were talking, and then I talk anybody I talk to that has a background in music, I always ask that question: How are you in math? I haven't found one person who says I'm horrible yet. <laughs> But you're funny. Count, I, I have to count to four. That's that's really good. Yeah, All right, it's so nine eight, I'm in trouble. So, All right. All right. Starting this company that you did uh, back with your brother because you needed insurance. It doesn't mean why you did it. Um, how and you've been doing it for 20 years. And this is the uh, company that does for uh, knowledge for employees. Is that the one? The screen yeah, steps? screen steps. It's about transferring knowledge to your employees faster. So all the operational knowledge of how your business runs, how they're supposed to serve your customers, how do you transfer that to them so that you're not constantly bag bogged down answering questions all day. And it must be totally different than it was 20 years ago. The problem is largely the same. The tools to solve it are vastly different. And uh, it's really an exciting time to be trying to solve this problem because there's just possibilities that we didn't have 20 years ago. And what are some of those possibilities? Well, obviously AI, you know, AI brings a lot of things. Two things have happened. One, we understand the problem better, you know, and most businesses think, oh, I just need to document my processes. Well, that's not enough. I mean, people spend hours, days, weeks uh, creating documentation that nobody ever uses. So we understand better how to transfer knowledge in an efficient way to employees. And now we have AI that can accelerate the process of creating the right content, guide us so that we're uh, adopting best practices and then make everything more discoverable, more usable. You had said something for a win for you today was to, for people to understand uh, not to use memorization. Yeah. One of the key things we built this framework over the years, it's called the find and follow framework. And we're primarily working with companies that deal with high complexity or high change in their business. So they've got, Think, you know, finance, healthcare, tech support, those things, high complexity, high change. And most of them are trying to teach their employees to know everything. 
They're trying to cram all this information in their head. And it's like pouring a gallon of water into a 16 ounce glass. It just doesn't fit. And so what we teach is assume that your employee will forget everything you teach them. How do you help them succeed in that moment when they don't remember what to do? And it changes the way you train. It changes the way you empower them. And that's really what our framework's about. And can you break it down a little bit more for us? Yeah. So if I'm going to train you, say you're in my business, I want you to take over um, collection, you know, uh, um, accounts receivable for me, right? And I'm going to train you there. Instead of recording a bunch of videos of how you do this in our accounting software and how you send the follow-ups and what's our policy on this or that or the other thing, I'm going to just spend a short amount of time saying, hey, this is what accounts payable is all about. These are the type of customers that you'll deal with. These are the tools that we use. And here's a high level overview of our policies. It's going to take 15 to 20 minutes to introduce those foundational concepts. And then I'm going to say, okay, how would you check who's past due on their account? I'm not going to show them how to do it. They're going to find a guide in our system. It's called Screen Steps. So you're going to search for our view past due accounts, and it will show them exactly what to do. And then I'll say, how will you update the payment date if somebody needs 30 more days to pay their bill? And they'll search that up and they'll follow it. And what's happening is as I, I give them scenarios and they find that they can find this on their own and follow it, they're realizing I don't have to memorize all this. I don't need to write down notes and I don't need to come back to Greg to ask him how to do this because I can rely on the digital guides. Now, to do that, you've got to have a different type of documentation than just a giant wall of words, but it's a very powerful way of training because it helps someone be productive very quickly and reduces the burden on the person supervising them of always having to jump in and answer questions and fix mistakes. Yeah, we. Um, I'm in the mortgage industry, and, and one of our wholesale lenders that's really big, they have a system that you go in there and type anything you want to know, and then right. it'll, it'll tell you how to deal with it and how to get it done. And yep. other issues, you know, if you don't understand a certain thing and just copy and paste it in there and I'll tell you exactly what it is. So basically it's pretty much what you're telling us, what you're telling is what we need. Cause a lot of us are, I'm former military, so I'm used to SOP standard operating procedure. Uh, yep. But from what you're telling me, that's not a good thing to have because nobody's going to read it. Well, if you don't design it right. So if you've got an SOP that somebody, we say everything has to be findable, followable, scannable meaning I have to be able to find it in five seconds. I have to be able to follow it without needing any assistance from anyone else. And I have to be able to scan it. So if I'm talking to a customer or a coworker, I can't have to say, hey, wait five minutes while I read this 10 page document. It's gotta be formatted in a way that it's helping me do the right thing without becoming an expert first. So we do that with a variety of things. Like we have decision trees in there that will ask the user question or the employee questions and just guide them through the process as they answer those questions or a, a checklist, you know, a reference article. We need to format it in a way that it can be consumed very quickly and right in the moment that they need it. Gotcha. Because it sounds to me like you don't have, they don't have to follow you like that you used to have them follow you or, or, you know, train the same way you could actually, like you said, be able to sit down with them and ask them questions. They can go find it and then eventually they will know how to find it. Um, by asking questions where before we didn't have anything like that. Exactly. And really the training, it's not that they are learning how to do it. They're gaining confidence that they can do it on their own because most employees, if they come into an organization, they say, we've got documentation. They've tried that before at other places where they've worked and you know, they can't make heads or tails. <laughs> they don't, they read it and they don't understand what to do. They still need additional help because that documentation wasn't, you know, wasn't followable. It wasn't scannable. When you create those guides, what you're really doing is helping them know that, hey, all those bad experiences you had at those other places, that's going to be different here. You're going to be able to rely on these guides, and they're really going to help you do your job. Yeah, back in the day when we first would train processors or the initial ones, we would have them scan documents. And they would see the documents as they're scanning them. And then, uh, you know, then 
they would read them somewhat, you know, a little yeah. bit, and then it would be they would they would see them. Then after a while, you know, a couple of weeks, you go, okay, now let's go through some of these different things. And but with what you're saying, that, that could be a totally different way of doing it. My way was fine because that was just the easiest way to introduce people to those types of documents. And when you said you remember seeing this type of doc, oh yeah, I totally remember seeing. It. They don't understand yeah. what it was in there and what the words were on it, but they understand seeing it, so they could understand what they would need to find when they would have to submit stuff. Yeah. You're, and that's, that's the key is you've introduced that to them. So now it's just like a, you know, a little placeholder for when they need that, they know where to go. And that's kind of what you're saying. This, the software is. Yeah, exactly. The software is designed. It combines, you know, courses, interactive guides. It's really, we call it a knowledge operations platform because it, some, some of our customers call it the brain. It is all the operational knowledge of your business has. So somebody can come in, be productive and everybody's going to be consistent in what they do. And now do you set one up for every company you deal with, or is it just a standard for different types of industry? Oh no, it's very custom to each company. Cause you can have, you know, you give the example of mortgage business, you can have 10 different mortgage businesses and the way they do things is going to be unique in each of those organizations. And so it's really important. What we're doing is it's very customized to their specific business rules. Now we don't create all of it for them. We give them the platform is very easy to use and very fast. So we're taking that person on their team that's constantly answering questions and we're turning them from a, we call it turning them from a knowledge spender into a knowledge investor. Instead of just answering questions all the time where that's just spending all that knowledge, they're gonna have to spend it again the next day. They're an investor, they answer it once, they make it clear and now people can reference that answer over and over again. Because for a lot of people who start a business, it's usually a business of one and then they start growing kind of like you, you guys did. Mm -hmm. And so to have something like this, to be there, to help them branch the difference and cause they don't have all the time to train, but be able to help people understand what they're trying to do and be able to program it or whatever you do to it. Um, I think it was a great idea. Yeah. It's, well, and the, the challenge that they have is a lot of times they say, Oh, I'm bringing someone in. I got to train them. And then they said, well, I got to document all this stuff. And so they think, what's all the stuff they need to know? And they start dumping all their knowledge onto them. But that doesn't actually help that new employee. You need to think, what do they need to be able to do? And you work backwards from what they have to be able to do. So part of our framework is really helping you define what does an employee in this role need to be able to do? And that actually ends up reducing a lot of the extra training and documentation that you don't need. All right. You were saying, so, yeah. So a key point is really helping those, um, those business owners and those supervisors know exactly not focus on what they need to know, but what do they need to do? When you understand that you can work backwards from, uh, building out your documentation. You can build as recipes instead of trying to build this giant encyclopedia. And how long does it normally take people to set these things up for their business or are they ongoing? They're ongoing. I mean, you think about it, any business you've been in, it's changing all the time. New scenarios come up. It's just what you do when that, that new situation comes up. Do you just tell somebody what to do? Or do you take a moment and say, hey, we're going to decide what our procedure is going to be here. Let's document so that every single time this comes up, we know exactly what to do. Right. And that's what I have done in my business. Every time we had an it, it, I don't want to say an issue, but anything that came up and it was something we would document to figure out how to go forward. So we'd never run into that again. And that yep, was, and exactly. then that would be to train the different processors and junior processors and everybody else to understand that, you know, if this comes up, this is where you need to look. So this would have been good for something like that. Yeah. And, it, and it's perfect because you can then also have this positive accountability, meaning if a mistake is made and somebody was following the guide, and the guide was incomplete, it's the guide's fault. If the mistake was made and they weren't following the guide, well, then clearly it's the employee's fault. But we just had this, you know, we, a mistake was made a couple weeks ago. We went back to the guide and we saw it was missing a step for that specific scenario. So it's not the employee's fault, right? We improve the guide and then that mistake won't happen again. Right. And it doesn't matter whose fault it is, just as long as we know how to deal with it going forward. Well, it, it's important to understand, though, is was the process wrong or was the person relying on their memory? Because they're fixing that as two totally different things, right? 
if, if somebody's just working from memory and not relying on the procedures, then that's a, a training thing for that employee. But if they're following your guides and, and they're getting it wrong, well, then the, the procedure needs to be improved. It needs to be clarified. Gotcha. Uh, what's the, in the 20 years of business, what was your largest failure? I think the largest failure I remember we or had a failure, you know, our failure. So I'll say, I'll tell you the most important one, maybe not the largest one, but the longest one, you know, we were a bootstrapped company. We're competing against very large competitors. And for a long time, it was really hard to get traction. I mean, we just, you know, you're competing against people who have uh, tons of funding, tons of resources, and you're a small team. But what that did to us is it forced us to not just try to compete on the same with the same rules. And so instead of trying to match them feature for feature, we went back and said, okay, we, we need to understand this problem better. And it forced us to really dig in with our customers, look at the customers that were super successful. What were they doing? How could we apply that? How could we uh, pr uh, prepare a recipe that would work across all customers? And that was a hard process, but it's been fantastic because now we have that understanding, that foundation that's helping us grow much faster. Wow. So just learn, be the, somehow be the authority in your industry is basically what I, I didn't hear it exactly like that, but basically how do you do more differently than other people? Is that what I hear? Yeah. But, and also really dig into the root cause of the problem. Like don't just treat it at a surface level but try to really understand what are your customers struggling with and what's the root cause of that? How can you solve that root cause? Cause that'll empower a lot of things. Yeah. What's, what's going forward with your business today? I mean, what are you seeing differently in the next couple of years? You talked AI in the beginning, right? Yeah. Cause that's the big, everybody's talking about AI. It's been around a while, but now it's just everywhere. Um, is that going to help train them better or there, or how's the AI going to help in this particular software? Well, so AI, you have to use it. You have to use it wisely. So a lot of people think they're just going to throw all their stuff at AI and then AI will be able to tell their employees what to do and solve all their problems. But AI is a garbage in garbage out application. It has to be fed the right knowledge. Now, when we look at chat GPT, it's been trained on all this publicly available knowledge but most of the knowledge about your business is not publicly available. Your operations, your procedures, your rules. And a lot of it is stuck in people's heads. So we see this opportunity right now to help them get that information out of their heads, get it in a way that it's very clear that it can not only help their employees, but also help drive future AI applications that they wanna integrate into their business. Because this becomes that single source of truth for how the business runs. And, and then the AI is going to majorly change over the next couple of years anyway. I mean, just yeah. take it so much smarter and smarter, you know. But it's always going to require good information. Of course. And well, see, like, it's a garbage in, garbage out thing in the past, you know. Exactly. If, you're always, if you're in software or whatever, you always knew that, right? I mean, and I always told people you, with chat GPT, you're limited by how you can think and ask it questions. Yep. But you're also, you know, if you've used ChatGPT, you'll find it's very eager to answer you even when it doesn't know the answer. So it will create things, you know, they call them hallucinations. So if you haven't really given it that knowledge, it's not designed really to say, oh, I don't know how to do that. It's designed to say, here's how you do it. Are you sure? And they're like, oh, I'm not quite sure, <laughs> you know, but maybe I was wrong on that. So it's really important that you use AI responsibly and and use it for the right applications you need a, still a human in that loop to check things that are accurate yeah because there was a couple of attorneys who got in trouble yeah the court cases that part of their stuff were real court cases <laughs> well there was one that uh it was a support story uh, i think it was air canada that the ai made up a policy and and they said well we don't want to be responsible for what the ai said they said well you put it on your website right you you put it out there in told the customer what to do. And so the court said they had to honor the policy that the AI invented. Well, if they're going to put it somewhere, it's in writing. Yeah. Well, the problem yeah. was that they were using an AI chat agent that was just oh. generating responses to the person. Gotcha. And it, and it totally invented this policy. So, you know, you, you have to be wise with AI and use it, uh, use it to accelerate things in your business, but don't just, you know, let it loose on your customers. Yeah. I, I, 
I want to talk to my customers. I don't want AI to talk to my customers. <laughs> I don't, it, it can somewhat learn, but it does not learn. But what I like, I use a certain software that when they text me, it'll give me three options to, to say something back. And, you know, some one out of three times, it's something I want to say back. But most of the time, it's way too long and way different than what I want to say. But eventually, well, it will be perfect because it's going to learn. Exactly. And and that's accelerating what you're doing versus replacing you. Right. And also making it easier to get back to your clients faster and so much, you know, there's only so much time that we have and this will give us more time back because yeah. I use it for my podcast stuff. Dra I mean, amazing what it's allowed me to do with my in podcasting. Yeah. And cut that's down the time. There. Yeah. Cut down the time of editing, cut down the time of everything. When they were saying it was not going to replace jobs, it's going to replace some jobs, but not all jobs. No, I think it's going to allow creatives to be much more productive. Um, right. It will remove some jobs that are more um, less creative. I'll say that you know they're just repetitive. Then AI will replace those things. Because I used to pay somebody to create uh, the my website page when I would promote the the episode but i use a software now that does it automatically it gives me everything <laughs> i need be, with you know i drop it in there and then a minute later it has everything i've ever asked it the way i want it and it's just a cut and paste so what that will allow me to do is have more other people take over what i want because it knows what i want and how exactly. to put it, right mm -hmm. something that used to take five people to do now takes one person to do yeah which means you can take those other, you could say, I just need one person to do this, or you can take those other four people and have them do higher value things. Mm -hmm. Or just have less employees. Yeah. Less overhead. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's why I, I'm in California. I don't know where you're out of, but we're an employee state that you're an employee period until proven otherwise. So <laughs> there is no um, contract in California, unless you're a, a real estate agent, but every, you know, that, but in my industry, there is no contracts, but unless you, you contract with somebody out of state. So if I want to do any type of marketing or have somebody handle my stuff and I don't want to pay them as employee, they have to be out of my state. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm outside, just outside of Washington, DC. So, uh, so you I know things are over. Yeah. Yeah. Certain areas are a little different. Yes. All right. All right. So it sounds to me like um, people need to check out your software because I think it, it will help business owners and people who are trying to teach their employees much faster and an easier way for them to understand your business. Yeah. It's really designed to be fast and clear so that that business owner is not going to be bogged down by questions all day. And then uh, you wrote the book, Find and Follow? Yep. Okay. Find and follow is just so there's the find and follow is the framework, how you do you understand what knowledge you need to create and how you design it so pe people can use it. And screen steps is a software that basically enables people to apply that framework. It gives you the tools you need to apply that framework. And how long did it take you to come up with this framework? Several years. years. <laughs> yeah, a couple of years. So we we get a theory like, okay, we think this is it. And uh, and we'd apply it to a couple of customers and would work with some and wouldn't work with others. So we'd tweak it and go back again and tweak it and go back again. And finally, we got to the place where, hey, this works every single time. And that's when we wrote the book and when we you know really started incorporating more into the software. Wow. Greg, how do people find you if they want to reach out, check out your software, get your book? How do they find all that? Yeah, they can see, go to gregdevore.com has, you know, um, you know, this podcast will be up there and different appearances I have find and follow book.com is the book and screensteps.com is, uh, our, my company. And, uh, it's on Amazon too, right? Yep. Yep. Find and follow on Amazon. Greg, thanks. For, thank, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate having you here today. No, thank you. Great talking to you. All right. Everybody make it a great day. Thanks again, sir. Yeah.